over 1,600 huts here before the British burnt them down to the ground. It's a little present I made for you. This is wonderful. I'm very touched, James. <laughs> I've heard that you have had this very deep interest in the history of the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879, yeah. in which our people, your people and mine were involved. I think that the great thing that comes out is that this was a conflict, unfortunate as it was, between two brave people, the British and the Zulus. And uh, I think that the Rock Strift battle itself, in which uh, the, the bravery of, of the few British soldiers came out so strongly. This was a conflict between brave people on both sides. James, I also have a, a little memento for you here. You know the Zulus, as you can see from our pictures, when they were best dressed, they were dressed in skin, so that from our point of view, I can't give you anything better than a skin. That's excellent. That's great. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So I hope you keep this and we'll remember our meeting today. <laughs> Thank you. Before I start on you, Major, what do you think about this guy? Oh, he's quite exceptional. Yeah. We love to see him in Brecon. Right. You're nine going on 47, you are writing a book like that. Howsomever, we think that was tremendous and we hope you... En Did you enjoy yourself? What was the nice part about going there? Meeting Chief Bristolese and going to become my man. That's right, because, see Major, somebody like that that never thought he would ever finish up there must have been a big buzz for him, yeah? Oh, tremendous. Tremendous. Wonderful. Yeah. Might you do him the honour of giving him yes, a general victory? Yes, Jenny, I should be delighted to do that. There we go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, all we can say is please look after yourselves real safe all week. See you next week for some more super Jim and Fix It's. for the complaints department. No, I will not hold on. This is outrageous. Excuse me, I'm looking Aren't we all, dear? Who is this room? Excuse me, I've got a serious complaint. Well, if you'd like to take a seat, someone will see you as soon as possible, OK? I grabbed the first person I made and just interviewed them spontaneous. I was wondering if you would... No, not you. OK, what okay. is it? <laughs> Dear Lady Fair Lammy. Oh, see, someone has some manners. Hello, I'm looking for directions. Someone! 
Dan had de rechts een gamtrein en gt Sipkap. I mean, we had a cup anyway, you know. Uh, You've had one go already. The, the woman at the back there in the hat. I'm just looking. Thank you, Sir Robert. Can play the concert? Why don't you try through there? Can play? Yeah, but we only do Ben Coppers in here, love. All right. A report published today by British scientists. Carry on. So you need. Just pass it through. David, so much. have a lovely trip. I have that one. Best time ever. You, 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 hello, hello. Who, me? You're the one that was here complaining the BBC is not as good as it used to be, aren't you? No, no. It, you must be confusing me with someone else. It's a hat. They're very, very popular these days. Hat. No one, but no one gives viewers and listeners a wider choice. The BBC, broadcasting at its best. Now on BBC One, the third semi-final of MasterChef. Welcome back to MasterChef 1994 and the last of our semi-finals as we near the end of the year-long search for the best amateur cook in Britain. Our three kitchen veterans are all winners. They're already the MasterChefs of London, the home counties and the southwest. As always, we'll be asking them to prepare a championship quality three-course meal for four people and to do it in just two and a half hours. There's only one much-coveted place left in the finals. Which of today's three cooks is going to get that place? Well, let's meet them first. In the red kitchen, Alison Fiander from New Malden in Surrey. Alison's a stalwart of Mary King's life class. Trying to get some depth. Alison's a special events manager, a job which demands discipline and creativity. It's not surprising that she numbers watercolor painting amongst her hobbies. And many an evening is spent at home with her intricate embroidery. One of Alison's own special events is to be driven in her father's vintage Rolls Royce, but we hope this isn't going to her head. In the yellow kitchen from Highgate, Fiona Phelps, London's new master chef. Fiona's relaxation is furniture restoration, a little therapeutic sanding and polishing is often enjoyed with her father at their family home in Camberley. Fiona recently married husband Andrew and works with him looking after the accounts of their business as tree surgeons. Having a head for figures and not for high skin if they strictly below sapling level. Finally, in the blue kitchen, the master chef of the Southwest, Roger Hemming, from Wellington in Somerset. A former mechanic in the RAF, Roger now manages an estate agency in nearby Taunton, where he and his team have turned a rather lame duck office to one of the most successful offices in the group. His business acumen is used to full advantage by the Wellington Roundtable, where he plays an important part in many of the fundraising events. On a Saturday night and a Sunday. When he gets a moment to relax, he and his wife Sarah take a walk around the Wellington Monument built to honor the Iron Duke. Welcome to you all. Alas, there's no head waiter to tell us what the specials are. So let's begin with you, Alison. What's on your menu? Yes. I'm going to be cooking salmon naan with pesto and balsamico cream, and then macadamia and sesame chicken on a Thai-style salad and for dessert, cappuccino cup. Well, I don't know if salmon naan is multicultural or cross-cultural, but I thought we would just see what it is. Fiona, what are you cooking? I'm starting with Rockfall tartlets. The main course is turbot on a bed of leeks in a dill and saffron sauce, followed by apricot mousse brulee. Wonderful, and that's a very rare appearance by turbot. So, mm. looking forward to that. And Roger, what have you got for us? To start with, there's a warm salad of scallops scented with cumin, and that's garnished with pine nuts and smoked bacon. The main course is a pan-fried breast of wood pigeon with a wild rowan berry sauce. And to finish, we've got a pink gin syllabub with an Angostura sauce. Well, we've had a few pigeons flying through the studio this year, so that should be quite interesting. Well, we could stay here chatting all day, but you are here to cook. So I'm going to send you off to the kitchen. Good luck, enjoy yourself, and let's get cooking.
kitchens at Mayfair's celebrated Connaught Hotel have for almost 20 years been under the creative control of chef de cuisine Michel Bourdin. Currently, one of his 40 strong brigade is former MasterChef semi-finalist Greg Lewis. Everything. So, you know, to me, the Coulibiac is not something new. Uh, for 30 years, I've been doing it once a week for 10 years in Maxim and 20 years at the Connaught. And I'm just following the, uh, what my ancestors were doing at the Cour of Russia 200 years ago. So now, Gregory, your turn. Huh? Thank you. Michel's the founding president in Britain of the Academy Culinaire de France, and he and his team ensure that whether eating in the Connaught's famous grill room or here in the restaurant, you'll enjoy a very British meal in the classic French tradition. Well, gentlemen, do you think I pass the test? Do you think the customer will allow me to cook for a few more years at the Connaught? <laughs> Michel, welcome to the program. It was very nice to see that Greg is doing so well in your kitchens. Do you think in the, oh gosh, 19 years that you've been at the Connaught, how have the young people who want to work in the kitchen changed? Well, they did change very much because uh, at first uh, there was not so much interest uh, to, prof to the profession as a profession. In Britain, it's only start in the 70s uh, to have uh, people interested to be professional. So the more uh, professional we will train, the more good place we will find. It starts always from the top, you know. As uh, one day Robert Caillé told me, that the best cooking was uh, the cooking amateur cuisinier, amateur chef. I say, yes, I agree, uh, Robert, but myself, I still work as an amateur because the best ingredient in cooking is love. And I think the amateur chef got love. Why do so many French chefs come and work in Britain? Uh, well, I think there have been a, a, a French influence in Britain for 300 years. And it just happened uh, to me about a month ago. I said to myself, why? did the French in 300 years didn't manage to pass the message to the British. And uh, I just realized that, that 100 years ago, when really there was many, many French chefs here with Escoffier and Ritz, you know, at this time of Grand Hotelry. And the simple reason was that the French didn't speak English and the English didn't speak French. So they couldn't communicate together. You're completely dedicated to the principles and the ideals of classic French cooking. But I think it's also worth pointing out to people who haven't been to the Connaught that you get the most marvelous British food there as well. The Connaught could be said that to be a, it's a British institution who have had French chefs since the beginning of the, of the century. I think I am the fifth chef in 100 years. But uh, I think at the Connaught we always been doing British cuisine because the bread and butter pudding, the Yorkshire pudding, uh, the white baits, uh, I was having it at, on the, in Maxim's menu where in the 60s when I was there. Do you ever have any longing to go back and, and work in France? Well, uh, you know, if uh, you consider that uh, the Connaught is one of the last great institutions in the world, you know, I don't think there are many places I can go after the Connaught. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of good sounds coming from the kitchen. Yes, so shall we go investigate? Yes, yes. And we'll begin by going to the red kitchen first. Ah, you're about to make pasta, I, I am assume. Indeed, yes. Um, that's right. I've just got everything ready so it makes it nice and easy once I'm assembling all the ingredients. I, I thought that there was a myth, or a commonly believed thing, that you should never cut basil with metal, the basil should be torn. I must admit, when I'm using it raw in a salad or whatever, I tend to, to tear the leaves and not cut them at all, because okay. I think that sort of yeah, is better. Be, 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 be tear, maybe. Yes, I indeed. It's very interesting to see the way you are organized. I keep telling my chef uh, that organization is half of the world. Do you believe in that? I do indeed. I've <laughs> often been called I'm a born organizer, and, and work-wise well, I need sure. to be uh, yeah. <laughs> well ahead. What I'm most puzzled about on your menu yes. is this thing called a salmon naan. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I'm actually using naan bread. Then it's simply a lay layering up job because I use my ultimate cream that I'm going to be making shortly. Then I have my smoked salmon, which I just have a little black pepper ground over. And then I drizzle that with the pesto 
quite interesting uh, flavor. That's right, yes. Mm. Um, and when I was experimenting, I did wonder perhaps if it would just be too powerful. Mm. But it actually, to my mind, works rather well I together. So I hope mm. you'll enjoy it. Thank Good. You. Thank you. Excellent. I like to hear confidence from a chef. Mm. So, you are preparing the potatoes? And in potatoes. To go with the turbot, isn't it? Yes. Um, it's interesting to see the turbot here. Yeah? Like yeah. Can we have a look yeah. at it? I always like to look at a turbot. Fish, it's a king of fish. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. They're all filleted. And of course, they're yeah. filleted. Yeah. This is, I think, the nicest bird since the thickest. Yeah. It's yeah. announced from quite a small turbot, though, isn't it? It is what yeah. we a call turbot a turbotin, yeah. that's right, yes. So a little, a little, little turbot, that's right, yes. yes. The turbo has very expensive community as well. The, uh, very, commodity, yes, sorry. Yes. But the turbo tin a bit uh, cheaper, but the big large turbo is it's very, very expensive. To get, yes. And you know that eventually mm. there, is, there could be <laughs> some difference between English and Scottish turbo. Yes. Doesn't taste the same. Oh, really? Yeah. Which is the Scottish the best, the best Scottish. One? Scottish. And are the mussels going to be in the sauce? Is it going to be like a, what do you say, called a diapoise or something? Yes, mussels are sauce diapoise. Yes, yes so I put them in the stock. Yeah. I let them cook in the stock and take them out and keep them warm while that's I finish right. the stock. That's right. And put them back in the sauce when it's finished. Yes, so right. it yes. should be flavoured with mussels. Ooh. Yes, and, and mussels give a very, very interesting flavour. I hope so. Well, <laughs> excellent. Sure it will be good. Thanks, Fiona. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Now, let's go over to the blue kitchen. Now, this is a sight that's guaranteed to make me happy. Someone making... Hello, Roger. Hello, hello. <laughs> someone, mashed someone making mashed potatoes. How much importance do you give to the potatoes for your mash? Do you choose uh, the right potatoes or you just hopefully, share potatoes? No, hopefully. I've, I've chosen some red ones here because I, I wanted them to be fairly floury rather than waxy. What potatoes do you use for mashed potatoes? I think uh, the, for mashed potatoes, essentially, the uh, Team Edward. Really, the potatoes make the dish, really. And, uh, uh, well. and can we see your, your pigeons? Because you've yeah, got, we're going to have yeah. a pan fry yeah, pigeon yeah. breast. That's the pigeon breast. Oh, that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. I cut them off myself. Mm -hmm. That's just it's my, my red wine, nice. and and like garlic, juniper, garlic, juniper, mm -hmm. bay leaf, and mm -hmm. a little thyme out of yeah. the garden. Mm. What's the best way, Michelle, to keep pigeon from getting tough? Because pigeon can be incredibly tough. Well, it is, is it just to undercook it? Well, uh, it is to recognize. Uh, a young pigeon, to a whole pigeon. Uh, I'm not too clever about it because we don't use pigeon at all at the Connaught because we got 10 different game, you know. So I thought we have enough. Well, we hope with the marinade might sort it, it out. Helps. It right. right. The marinade will help you, but you know, still, it has to be a young pigeon. Yes, the marinade is the equivalent That's of right. a sort of gastronomic facelift, isn't it? You can't tell how old the thing is. <laughs> right, we should be back to you. Okay. Thanks, Roger. Okay, okay. Right. Well, it's all going to be pretty interesting. Yep. Let's just review the menus, actually, and get some sort of feel for them. Now, Alison is doing salmon naan with pesto and balsamico cream, and then macadamia and sesame chicken on Thai-style salad, and then something called a cappuccino cup. It's a very modern-sounding menu. Yes, but uh, I'm quite at pleased with uh, the balance of it. It's not too heavy, just uh, different uh, tastes, and I uh, don't think they go against each other. So. So far, it seems to be interesting, the reading of it. Yeah. The testing will tell us, but the reading of it is quite satisfactory. Yeah. I mean, nothing, I can't find anything wrong with it. No, it makes very good bedtime yeah, reading, yeah, actually. Yeah, I like the look of that menu. Yeah. In the um, yellow kitchen, Fiona's doing a rock for and spring onion tartlets on a bed of lamb's lettuce mm -hmm. with a red currant walnut dressing, and then baked turbot and mussels with dill and saffron sauce, steamed leeks, some julienne fried potatoes, and an apricot mousse brulee. Mm -hmm. Here again, it's an uh, interesting write-up. Uh, the reading is interesting, and uh, I would like to, have to go for this menu, you know. Yeah. No, no major fault in it, you know. Yeah. And it's interesting to see a different creme brulee, and uh, this food, you know, which uh, always creme brulee is my favorite, so. Oh, good. Right. Okay, so you're going to enjoy that for him. And uh, then in the blue kitchen, Roger is doing a warm salad of scallops, perfumed, very poetic, with cumin. Then pan-fried pigeon breasts on a crouton with wild rowan sauce, mashed potato souffle, roast root vegetables, and then a pink gin syllabub. Yes, that's another interesting menu. I think uh, your contestant seems to get better and better. And so uh, I'm sure that uh, amateur cuisine uh, is getting very strong in this country. And 
programs. Okay, so we professionals will have to be careful not to be better than us. I must say, I'm looking forward to the souffle of mashed potatoes. Interesting, yes. It's going to be very pretty. Mm. Does one of them, one of these menus, attract you more than any of the others at this moment or not? No. At this moment, no. I think they all got the chance to to win because it's all uh, interesting, with no major fault. And the test will decide. So we're both being pulled in three directions. Yeah, that's right. Now, for the last of our competitions in this series, we're turning to saffron, which Fiona is using in the sauce she's making for her turbot. To take part in the competition, just call this number and answer this question. From which flower is saffron obtained? Is it A, the daffodil, B, the crocus, or C, the orchid? Now, I know Michelle knows the answer, and if you know the answer, ring 0891 4477711. When you call, I'll repeat the question. The prize for the first correct answer drawn out of our huge hat is a glamorous evening of whining and dining for two at the establishment of one of our guest chefs. If you're lucky, it might even be at the con art, and we'll throw in overnight accommodation as well. We've got 2,000 lines open until midnight tomorrow, so why not give us a call? Now, last week, we asked you about mushrooms. The answer to the question is that the puffball is the largest edible variety. This must be the ingredients for the Thai salad. That's right, yes. And then I still have to make the dressing, which is um, actually using peanut oil and wasabi paste, which gives a nice kick. Um, and in addition to the wasabi paste, I use rice wine as well. Now, I want to see your macadamia nuts, because I think right. they're one of the great... Yes, I've put those through the Magimix, chopped yep. them, and just folded in some of the sesame seeds. So that, in effect, is then the coating for my chicken. Macadamia nuts are very, very buttery. Yes, wonderful, oh, rich flavour. <laughs> yes, but once in a while, I think they're great. Yeah, absolutely. I like the idea of uh, adding apri apricot with brulee, creme brulee, I think. Sort of Usually we put, uh, sometimes we put uh, fraise de bois or raspberry, yeah, uh, yeah. but apricot is beautiful. I think uh, it was in season, so... Yes. Do you know the origin of the creme brulee? Mm -hmm. It's always been an, uh, an, well, an argument between France and Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, people say it has been invented in Scotland, yeah. and the French people say it has been invented in French. France. But I think it, I rather think uh, Scottish have... Uh, Done it before us. Mm? Yes. It? it sounds French, doesn't it? Yes, but uh, the Scotch have been using a few French names as well. <laughs> <laughs> Roger, you've got a couple of unusual ingredients, a bit of gin. Oh, I'd better not share the label. And some um, Angostura bitters. Pink. And so you're mixing a pink gin, and this yes. is for your silly pot. That's right, it's a tale behind this, actually. It's my father-in-law's an ex, well, he's a retired merchant marine captain. And uh, every evening before his dinner, he enjoys a pink gin. So this is really a gin in his honour. I think about 10,000 creep points for saying that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth saying. <laughs> Things are well underway, so it's time to meet this evening's second guest, a man who for decades has helped Britain decide where to eat. Welcome to Egon Rene. Egon, how do you decide what makes a good meal? Well, it very much depends on your, on your taste buds, and, and, and it's a very individual judgment. Food is a matter of taste, and you cannot be dogmatic about it. Recently, you've been devoting a lot of time to the catering at Heathrow. Yes, that has become uh, my main uh, preoccupation, shall we say, uh, trying to improve the food at Heathrow and Gatwick. I sometimes feel when I'm traveling that I would have been better off bringing a picnic in a brown paper bag. <laughs> what do you do when you're on a plane or in an airport? Or <coughs> do you just resign yourself or do you bring well, your own food? It all depends if it, is, uh, if it is a long journey. I think for a long journey, uh, we like to have an enjoyable meal to cut down the journey, you know. But uh, it's difficult to get an excellent meal, except if you are traveling first class. What an extremely diplomatic and polite man Michel is. I would quite briefly say that the food on the airlines, on airplanes, is quite terrible. <laughs> well, uh, perhaps first class, well, perhaps not so much. Well, but I've had you know, a lot of bad first class meals as well. 
it has got convenient food, it's still convenient food. If you want to have proper food, it has to be done in a proper environment. And Michel, uh, I don't want to disagree with you on television, but you know, if you have a bread roll or a sandwich, that has to be excellent. Otherwise, don't do it. Now, I want a judgment from both of you. How well can you really eat in Britain compared to other countries? Uh, Britain has been always a place of good eating, but in a decade, or so I will say that we will eat as well as in Britain than we are eating in France. The problem, I think, is that there were tremendous developments, both at the bottom end and at the top end. But in the middle, the good bistro type, the family type of catering, uh, at a high level, with simple, down to earth food, that is what is missing. Egon, if any government were intelligent enough to make you the man in charge of all food in this country. <laughs> what would you do? What would be your first act as chief of food? Uh, well, uh, I would ease uh, all the financial burdens that, uh, pre that are pressurized small caterers. I think that, uh, to make life easier for them in every respect, that would be my first priority. And uh, secondly, uh, on the, at the top end of catering as well, a certain I right. have to keep everyone in suspense because the big green 10 has right. appeared on the screen. Right. And that means there's only 10 minutes of cooking time left. The lights are flashing, so it's pink gins for everyone. The cooking time's over. In the red kitchen, Alice and Fiando prepared a salmon naan with pesto and balsamico cream, followed by macadamia and sesame chicken on a Thai-style salad. Her pudding was a cappuccino cup. Fiona Phelps in the yellow kitchen gave us a rock four and spring onion tartlet on a bed of lamb's lettuce. Her main course was turbot with mussels and a dill and saffron sauce served on a bed of steamed leeks with a julienne of fried potatoes. An apricot mousse brulee rounded off the menu. In the blue kitchen, Roger Hemming started with a warm salad of scallops perfumed with cumin and moved on to pigeon breasts on a crouton with wild rowan sauce. This was accompanied by a herb souffle of mashed potato with roasted root vegetables. Roger's finale was a pink gin syllabub with an angostura sauce. Are we ready? I think so. Good. I think so. Let's let's taste, and we'll um, begin with the the red kitchen. Um, and Allison is um, kicking off with this extremely intriguing naan salmon naan with pesto. And before we tear it apart, do you do you like the look of this meal, Egon? I think uh, I think so. This uh, intriguing. Uh Dessert is supposed to be? Cappuccino cup. Cappuccino cup. Cappuccino cup. Cappuccino cup. Cappuccino cup. Cappuccino very interesting. Very interesting. What do you reckon, Very appetizing. Well, um, I, I will think uh, the first course, look of the first course and the, la the last course is very appealing to my eye. Wonderful colors. Let's, let's, yes. let's dig into this. We don't, <coughs> we don't spend a lot of time on etiquette. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm intrigued by this because the idea of salmon and naan and pasta and... Mmm, very pleasant. Mm. Very pleasant. And a nice combination of flavor without too much excess of one flavor. Refreshing flavor. And very refreshing mm -hmm. flavors. Lovely. Very nice. So now, this is macadamia and sesame chicken on a bit of Thai style salad. Mm. There should be a bit of a kick to it. First impression is that the chicken itself, the raw material is good. Mm -hmm. Don't you think? And here again is the nice freshness of the whole thing together. You know, it's a good balance of flavor. I think this is excellent. Yeah. I really do. Mm. Um, I don't know what you think. Perhaps it's 
in its own category, perhaps even better than the first was. It is a main issue. I think uh, the the, the, the follow-up is uh, interesting because it has to go crescendo, really. It's a good build-up. It yes. is a good build-up. And it's yes. lovely and light yep. as well. It is, yes. So this is the cappuccino yeah. cup, and it does look like a cup of cappuccino. Yeah, yes. <coughs> the idea of the, the name with the, the, the way it's presented and the flavor goes beautifully well. I think it's a very intelligent sweet. Mm. And it's lovely at the end of the meal. And made with very mm. nice mm. tasting espresso Absolutely. to begin with, I think. Yes, yes, exactly. It's quite a, quite a good idea to yeah. serve it in this cup. Absolutely, yes. It's mm. original, mm. and uh, it's a very finely put together, this mm. mousse. Yeah. yeah, very good. good. Yeah, okay, good idea. let's move on, because we're going on to the um, yellow kitchen. Do you like these colors? And I think this uh, main course is most attractive yeah. to put together, yeah. don't you yeah, think? Absolutely, yes. It's uh, very strong out. Uh, yes. nice yeah. Yeah. And I want to taste this. A roquefort and spring onion tart mm -hmm. on a bit of lamb's lettuce. Surprisingly good. Mm. When I say surprisingly, I mean that the first appearance wouldn't have led me to believe uh, how refined you know, the, 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 the flavor is really what it should be, you know. And I was a bit worried when you said Roquefort, mm -hmm. and it is not overdone. I mean, not overbearing taste. So it's a nice light balance. Yeah, very well judged. Very well judged. I think mm -hmm. you get the, you can really taste the Roquefort, mm -hmm. but it yeah. doesn't, it, it doesn't, doesn't take over. over. Yeah, no. And this is turbot and mm -hmm. mussels mm -hmm. in a dill and saffron sauce. Mm -hmm. And some leeks. Yeah. The combination is quite good. I mean, it's uh, nothing is uh, overpowering, except that the saffron is a very powerful ingredient, and if you put too much, it could be overdone. But in that case, I think it's just right, and they go very well with the white fish and the mussel. It's obviously a good dish. I preferred the first course. Uh, this is perhaps a little bit too underplayed. I agree that it's, it's hard to follow on from the rock fall, yeah. which has such an <coughs> assertive flavor. Yeah, but yeah, this, sharp, but I think, is a, is a piece a of turbot that's <coughs> really nicely cooked. Mm -hmm. Here we are. An apricot mousse brulee. Breaks rather neatly. The taste is very good. The consistency, perhaps, yeah, a I mean, bit, a little little bit liquid, liquid, yeah. but, but uh, yeah, the taste is very well flavored. Yeah. And I think the idea of having a little bit of uh, ground uh, nuts with it make it more <coughs> interesting than the normal, the the normal, normal plain, yes. plain uh, creme brulee. On to the blue table now. Roger beginning with a warm salad of scallops infused, perfumed, excuse me, perfumed with cumin. It's difficult to believe that all this uh, is being not done by a professional chef. True. Don't you think True. it looks True. so professional? It's good. Um, wonderful looking scallops. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to see how the cumin comes through with these lava on things. It does come through. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's a very pleasant contrast, a bit uh, um, exotic for me, uh, which uh, as a French person, I I like to test uh, what this, these things are, really. What I think is, is very much to the advantage of the dish is the dressing of the salad. It gives a good basis for the whole yeah. thing. I like it, but then I'm an exotic kind of guy. This is pan-fried pigeon breasts on a crouton. That's wild rowan sauce. Mm. Souffle, very yes. pretty. Mm -hmm. Souffle mashed potato and roast root vegetables. Mm -hmm. Uh, we just for, can I go your, your mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, okay. uh, the, because the cuisson of, of the pigeon is just perfect. It's a red meat, so you know it has to be this color. Very good. Really very good. Mm -hmm. The smooth vegetable are very, very interesting and goes quite well with uh, game. Mm. Absolutely. Most accomplished. Yeah. The, the, I mean, the texture of the bird beautifully yeah. preserved. Yeah. Just, uh, it looks much more underdone than it actually tastes. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, 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 it's actually, I would say, it's perfect. It's just right. Very pleasant. And very right. nice sauce. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, it sauce goes so well with it. Yeah. Sauce. Lovely and light. I like this dish very much. Good. And then, <coughs> pink gin syllabub. Pink gin <laughs> syllabub. Well, 
Did it's it nothing did. like invention. So. With <laughs> Angostura sauce. Oh. Uh, this is going to be quite a quite a bitter, mm -hmm. a bitter little pudding. <clears throat> oh, it's good actually. Yes, it's very good. good. Mm. The, the person who made this uh, is a certain, a very courageous person. But courage sometimes pays off, yeah, and it's it very good, mm. I, I must say. It's, uh, There's quite a lot of gin in it. Yes, it is. But, you know, I, mean, well. <coughs> I like the way it's presented, you know. It gives us I mean, possibility I, to do the quantity of, uh, of the, this other ingredient. Absolutely. In fact, mm -hmm. I would like to have a little more. Good. A sensible pudding to finish with. So, what we shall do now, if you follow me, we shall go off and, and be judicious. Okay. We'll go into our judging okay. area. So just follow me. <coughs> Style salads. I thought the pineapple went very well with the mushrooms and the sweet peppers. And it was a lovely, it was very refreshing. Yeah. I could eat that for lunch. Yeah. Or yeah. First course was a challenge to have a rock for tartlet before the the fish because you know the roquefort is a strong ingredient and the fish could have suffered the salad dressing was the outstanding thing about it supported well the scallops mm -hmm. and so on it was a light uh, very pleasant start of the meal the balance of flavor and texture and the sauce who goes with it was superb and i think it matched exactly uh, what the pigeon will ask for the sauce you know and i think the cappuccino idea is was a very clever idea to finish uh, for the, the, the look point of view and the taste. We were not disappointed. To finish a meal with a, with a slightly alcoholic taste is not a bad idea. Well, I like depends, it depends on what you, what you <laughs> think <laughs> with it. But, you know, um, <laughs> Guess you'd have to drink the glass again with it. It certainly, it certainly didn't need a digestif after right. this one. Right. For almost the last time in this series, we've deliberated, cogitated and digested and with the utmost difficulty, which we've come to expect from the semi-final, arrived at a decision. Egon, this is your first go as a MasterChef judge. What did you think about the standard? Many of the dishes were truly perfect, and I don't easily use that word. It could not have been improved, even by a professional chef, and some of the dishes could have been served uh, in, in uh, one of the best restaurants in London. Michel, how did you feel? Well, I, I did feel that uh, um, this uh, amateur cuisine was quite uh, professionally done, and uh, I shouldn't fault any any combination of menu. Um, I would like, of course, to see maybe a little bit more of uh, from those amateurs to come into this profession of chef, because uh, we need more people coming into this profession. Well, I think that we three judges would be happy to be cooked for professionally by any of tonight's three contestants. Exactly. And thank you all very much. The winner, though, who will join us for next week's grand final is Alison Fiander. Oh, thank you very much. So very well done to Alison Fiander. She will join Elaine Bates from Minchin Hampton in Gloucestershire and Jerry Goldwire from Eskbank near Edinburgh in a week's time when we decide the MasterChef of Britain 1994. So many, many congratulations to Alison, to Fiona and to Roger for giving us an amazing treat for this last of our semi-finals. Thanks to Egon Rone and to Michel Bourdain for bringing such a wealth of experience to our judging and see you all next week for the grand final of MasterChef 1994.